Welcome, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for returning back to our interview with, with John Gustin. John, thank you for joining us again. It's good to see you. Thank you. And I know there were a host of questions our team, uh, our John was unable to answer last week, but we're going to answer them this morning. I printed out as many as I can. As always, if you have questions, please add them to the chat. To the extent that we can get them answered today, we will. If we do not, you know our team is responsive, we're honorable, and we're going to answer it. So if we don't address it today, rest assured we will address it and answer it in the written word or via an upcoming webinar. You have our word. John and I had a conversation earlier today, and I wanted to open this you know, to get your insights because you are a subject matter expert who for more than 24 years worked with the Federal Bureau of Prisons. You have a lot of knowledge and expertise. That's why you're here. I messaged you that someone in our community had a call with a lawyer, and the lawyer was really dismissing the idea that a former CEO who employed hundreds of people who built businesses over a sustained period of time he laughed at the idea that one, he would need to work on a plan for a sentencing judge when a sentencing could be a year and a half in the future. And also it kind of laughed at the idea that a release, that a case manager in prison would even find value in the, this release plan, insinuating that it's beneath him to have to do this given his success. I don't think this defendant understood the stakeholders. Would you offer your insights on how a judge or a case manager would respond to someone who thinks creating a release plan could be beneath them? Yeah, I would tell you that the same thing I, I tell a lot of people. You know, we are here to assist you in your personal advocacy. How can you make your prison sentence better? How can you make your release plan better? And I would tell you that this process, this system always requires a little humility. It requires that, you know, none of us are perfect. We all have our faults and all of us can better ourselves. And if that's through attending classes or programs in the Bureau of Prisons, that's great. If not, there's still other things you can do inside the prison system and in preparing for your reentry to better yourself. And that's what you need to put in those plans. I, I used to, to laugh a lot when somebody would say, well, I have no reentry needs. I'm a lawyer. I plan on practicing law again when I get out. I, I have a support system. I don't need anything. Well, then why do I need to send you to a halfway house? Why do I need to send you to home confinement? You're good to release on your full term release date from prison because you don't need any assistance from me whatsoever. And that's really how they look at it. If you don't have goals or needs, you know, well, if you don't have any goals or needs, then why do I need to, to, to waste our precious resources and send you to a halfway house or home confinement? You can release on your full term release date. So, yeah, I, I tell everybody, please advocate for yourself. Please show some humility. And please do a release plan on those things that you intend to do while you're, and if that's, I'm going to write a book, that's part of a reentry plan. That, that's part of what, how you're going to better yourself. If that's, I'm willing to lay around on my bed and do nothing, that will be received as you have no desire or have no needs for reentry. You're, you're good to go as it is. So that's the takeaway for this part of the call. There, there are people who are preparing for sentencing. who are told it's too early to prepare. And in so doing, they don't begin to create a record for a judge that shows why they're worthy of leniency, even if you're two years out from sentencing. I share the story of Judge Carter, a judge in Santa Ana, who told a private equity manager, you have more than 40 character reference letters. You've been sitting at home for three years. You're telling me with your letters and education, no one would hire you. What have you been doing for three years? If you do not begin to create a record through your own efforts and words that demonstrates why you're worthy of leniency and through the pre that pre-sentence plan will, of course, transition into the release plan, you're going to get the outcome that you deserve. You haven't done the work. Therefore, why are you worthy of a shorter sentence or earlier release? It's up to you to take the advice that we get from federal judges and experts like John Gustin. What you choose to do with it, it's your choice. Our team encourages you, presuming you want success at every stage of the journey. Once this webinar is over, if you haven't been sentenced, begin to create the plan. And if you've been sentenced, transition to the release plan. John, let's transition to some changes that took place with the CARES Act this week. We got a question from someone that said, John or Mr. Gustin, have you heard any news or updates on why the release dates on BOP website are changing, yet some are? On January 10, 2023, was there supposed to be an update on FSA credits? Are they getting applied? 
what are you hearing about updates to the system? That's the question. So what I'm hearing and seeing is that yes, updates are happening. And updates have happened in grand ways. There's been a lot of immediate releases. There was a lot of individuals that started to see earn time credits. Having said that, I think there's still some work that the Bureau of Prisons is doing that not all of them got updated. Uh, different institutions had keyed things differently in Sentry. They had keyed things differently, and that may or may not have affected the way some of the sentence computations were updated. If your sentence comp wasn't updated and your release date and the application of First Step Act credits wasn't done, you need to have that conversation with your case manager about why it wasn't updated. And there, there's a just a plethora of reasons. There's tons of things. You hadn't had your needs assessment done. It wasn't key that you had it done. Uh, there's just a lot of different reasons. And the other thing that I understand is they prioritize those that are closest to release. So there may still be some that are pending. I know that they're working very hard on it, very diligently. And I know personally, I have seen that a ton of people have been affected where they did get it updated Monday or Wednesday. So I know they are definitely working on it. Thank you for that. President Biden, as I read, extended the emergency due to COVID. And that's potentially good news for people who qualify and who are in, are in custody. Someone in our community asked, if I am released to home confinement pursuant to the CARES Act, will I be under authority of the Bureau of Prisons or probation while I'm at home? Yeah, so interesting, anytime you go on home confinement and you're still serving a portion of your sentence, you are the custody of the Attorney General. The Bureau of Prisons does have an agreement in some jurisdictions where probation will be supervising you as a courtesy to the Bureau of Prisons, but you are still under the authority and jurisdiction of the Bureau of Prisons at that time. If someone, go, if someone is released due to the CARES Act, will they go to the halfway house or do, do they go directly home? They can either or. So CARES Act allows for, for earlier placement in the community, and that can include both a halfway house and home confinement. That can include just home confinement. There's a lot of variables that come into play there, and we're seeing both. We're seeing individuals that go to a halfway house and then go to home confinement. We're seeing those that just go to the halfway house and conceivably stay there, and we're seeing those that just go to home confinement directly from the institution. Someone asked if they have health issues and they believe they would be a worthy candidate for COVID and CARES Act, how could they document or advocate for themselves to their, their case manager? And I'm presuming the answer might tie into the release plan and documenting it. But if someone feels they qualify, what suggests would you su suggest they take? Yeah, so always if there's medical issues that make you more successful to COVID under the CARES Act and you believe that may be appropriate, the more medical records you have to support that assertion, the better off you're going to be. Take those medical records, take the documentation that you have, go into your case manager and, and spell out, here's why I think I'm eligible for CARES Act and have that communication with them. Okay, that's important for everyone listening. The, again, it's not telling, excuse me, it's not, yeah, it's not telling, it, it's showing. And right. it's understanding that they're expecting many people to go in and ask for earlier release due to COVID or more halfway house time. If you have a record behind you, if it's done in the pre-sentencing work, if it's done in the post-sentencing work, if you have a record, you increase your chances. People, John, are naturally, and having gone to prison, I know as soon as you want to get in, you want to program and begin to get these earn time credits naturally. Someone asked, I'm getting ready to surrender to prison. How soon after my entry into the Bureau of Prisons will I begin to calculate earned time credits? So the Bureau of Prisons has said that you will they will begin the calculation as soon as your needs assessment is done. Okay. So upon how how your is... arrival, yeah, upon your arrival to the Bureau of Prisons, generally they're going to do a team meeting with you, meeting with your case manager within the first about 48 to 72 hours. At that time, you should be inquiring about how soon can I take my needs assessment? How soon can I get this stuff done? Because you want, it's, it's paramount on you to make sure that you're getting this done and there's some, some parts that have to be done by the individual. 
And then the next time you meet with your case manager, they can complete that. Generally, it's within 90. That's it. Generally within 90 days. That, that's a good timeline for everyone to manage expectations so you're not running to your case manager's office within six seconds of your surrender asking right. to participate. No, but the, John, those things happen, right? Because I right. know I've been to prison and when I went to prison, my thoughts Dana. were, what can I do to get out? Hi. So I want everyone to understand that this is a process to be patient. I'm fine. How are you? If everyone can mute themselves. Oh, yeah, that's good. Uh, did you finally get uh, the Forget other document? Forgive me, John. Give me one second. I I have muted mm -hmm. everyone, but they have chosen to. Yeah, I know. It's it, uh, unless sorry. you have a computer, uh, the you know the verbiage gets a little difficult to read. John, I'm going to mute I, everyone, and then if you can unmute yourself. One moment. Okay, John. All right. I think I'm unmuted. <laughs> All right. Good. Th thank. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. The same same person asked about um, going directly to the halfway house versus home confinement. Are there scenarios where someone can go directly to home confinement? And is that only because of COVID and the CARES Act or are there other instances where someone can go directly to home confinement instead of the halfway house? So there's always been statutory authority to designate somebody to either home confinement or the halfway house. Generally direct placement on home confinement as a designation, meaning your designation to home confinement is not done. Uh, we, the, the thought is that if the judge wanted you on home confinement, they would have sent you to supervision. So generally you're, you're not going to go directly to home confinement. The CARES Act has allowed and has put some people directly out on home confinement, but it's preferred that you at least go to a halfway house to get assessed and to determine your needs and all that prior to placement. And quite frankly, it's even more preferred that you go to a Bureau of Prisons institution initially than to a halfway house, then to home confinement. Something our team stresses is the power of, of advocacy and creating a record and learning how to do that on days where it might not even benefit you. It could take weeks and months or years to pay off. I ask that because some people presume if they someone has said, I'm going to hire a lawyer, the lawyer is going to write a letter to the warden that shows why I should get out of prison early. That's not really the process. If someone is looking to seek an earlier release, perhaps due to COVID and the CARES Act, what advice would you give them? Is it administrative remedy paperwork they're going to fill out? Should you, do you suggest they wait until they've served 25% of their sentence and have uh, 18 months left to serve? Some people go in for a four-year sentence. Three days later, they say, I want to get out due to COVID. It doesn't work well. So what advice would you have for people looking to advocate for themselves? So I want to be careful on our terminology. Thank when you. we talk about early release due to CARES Act, the only avenue for early release due to CARES Act is compassionate release. And compassionate release requires that you file an admin remedy requesting compassionate release to through your case manager to the warden of the institution. The warden makes that recommendation and then it goes through a legal process to determine whether or not that compassionate release is going to be granted. When we talk about early placement in either a halfway house on home confinement, that decision and that determination is made at the case management level. The case manager is reviewing and looking at your paperwork, looking at your release plan, making a determination, are you eligible for early placement in an RC or home confinement as a condition of the CARES Act? And if so, they're making that referral. It's routed through the ward and the ward signs off on it. It goes out to the RRM's office and they approve or deny it. So just, I caution everybody, placement. I think I got muted there again. Yes. But I, I just caution everybody that placement in the community under the CARES Act is not a release. It is a transfer to the community. You are still in custody and still in, under the authority of the attorney general. Thank you very much. I want to continue to jump around to some questions we didn't answer sure. from last week. Unfortunately, someone in our community's husband went to the, the hole for an issue. And the question was, while he's in the hole, does this affect his earned time credits? So the last guidance that I saw from the Bureau of Prisons is that individuals that are in the special housing unit under an administrative placement, so they're pending a sanction or pending disciplinary, may still earn earn time credits. 
once they switch over or are sanctioned for disciplinary behavior, then the determination is made on the disciplinary hearing officer whether or not they're going to take earned time credits and what their status is. So for everyone watching, our team has filmed myriad webinars on how to avoid problems in prison, how to create a reentry plan, the understanding of the First Step Act. So many people say they will never get into trouble in prison. And we get a call from a loved one that says their husband or their loved one is in the shoe and it really derails their progress. Please use all of the resources we give you at no cost through prison professors, including investing the time to go through these webinars that we have filmed. What is a disciplinary infraction? How do you respond to the disciplinary infraction? How are they created? We've also addressed people who are getting, continue to get into trouble on federal probation and have their probation violated or troubles in the halfway house. We've covered all of this. Come with questions, but please watch the webinars. So the, the issue of halfway house, John, uh, people are asking simple question. What's the maximum amount of halfway house time the law even allows? So which law? <laughs> that's the that's right always question. the question. Yeah. Yeah, that's always the question. So the First Step Act, well, let's start with the Second Chance Act. Second Chance Act allows for up to 12 months halfway house and up to six months or 10% of your sentence, whichever is less on home confinement. So that's under 1836-24. The First Step Act came in and said that if you have earned time credits, earned time credits can be applied towards longer placements in either the halfway house or on home confinement in excess of the statutory requirements under the Second Chance Act. So if you had two years of earned time credits, the first 12 months of that, according to the, the guidance that I have seen, is would go towards early release, placement on probation. Anything above those 12 months could be played, allow you longer placement. So conceivably, again, if you go, if you had the 24 months, you can get 12 months of your earned time credits applied towards an early release and 12 months of it applied towards either RRC or home confinement placement, either one, because the earned time credits eliminate the statutory requirements under, under the Second Chance Act. Very helpful, thank you. So, several people on our webinar right now live in Boston area. And two of them actually wrote the same question, essentially. I heard that the halfway house in the Boston area is closed, still closed due to COVID. Will that delay my pre-release of, or could they send me directly to home confinement? But what happens if there's no halfway house to, to send them? Could they stay in prison longer or reroute them elsewhere? So I actually saw that question last uh -huh. week and did some follow-up on it. Thank Nobody you. that I contacted was aware of the halfway house in Boston being closed. There are some restrictions and they did have a quarantine session at the halfway house in Boston, but they're still monitoring individuals on home confinement and they're still monitoring individuals inside the halfway house. So there's no language or, or no information that I've been able to find that shows that facility is closed due to COVID. Thank you. And thank you, that's, that's helpful. It's good to get the correct information. On our webinar last week, we mentioned the value of the reentry plan and sharing it with all stakeholders, including a, a, even a, on the pre-sentencing issue with the judge, case manager in prison. Someone asked, should they also send that information, the release plan to the person in the halfway house or should it all just go to their probation officer or both? What insights would you have as people share their release plan with various stakeholders? So I would encourage you to take that plan with you when you transfer to the halfway house. Within 72 hours of you arriving at that halfway house, you're going to meet with your case manager. And that's when you're going to sit down and actually walk them through your reentry plan and what your needs are. And quite frankly, what your expectations are while you're at the halfway house. Hey, I appreciate the fact that I'm here. Here's my goals why I'm here. Here's what I'm looking to do. And as you can see, I've really outlined this and put a lot of thought into it. Here's my reentry plan. Here's how I've met my goals while I was incarcerated. And this is what I want to do moving forward. Because that's really a strong message. That's really somebody who's coming out here. They're really motivated. They're, they're really looking towards the future. And I want to do everything I can help do to help that person. So that's, that's helpful. As, as people advocate to try to get their loved one more halfway house time, Sometimes they may try to reach out to the halfway house. Someone wrote, should family members call ahead to the halfway house to check availability? No, 
<laughs> yeah, just just emphatically no. I mean, the residential energy manager manages the beds at the facility. There's so much that the staff at the facility may or may not know about the pipeline or what's happening in the Bureau of Prisons. Um, as you said earlier, Justin, they released, you know, thousands of inmates on Monday. Of those thousands that were released, of course, that freed up bed space and individuals in the prison are then seeing their earned time credits that they now want to apply towards halfway house placement. So you're going to see a, a backfilling of all those that release from the halfway house, from the prisons, and those people in the halfway houses may not know what those numbers look like yet. Got it, very helpful. Someone asked, someone in our community is currently in prison sent this message via, via core links. Please ask Mr. Gustin, is there a chance I'll be able to run my business while in the halfway house? Uh, and do I have to be a W-2 employee of the business? Can I be an independent contractor? What, what advice would you offer to, to someone? Yes, there's a chance. There's always a chance. I mean, that nothing in the Bureau of Prisons is finite except the end of your sentence. But you can very much, again, was your employment, did you work at that employment prior to coming in? If you can get a letter or some kind of endorsement from your probation officer saying that probation's going to allow you to work at that, the more information you can put in your release plan about how you're going to work at it, what your normal income is, and doesn't necessarily have to be a, a W-2. It can be a 1099-R. It can be anything that shows that income and exactly what it is you're going to be doing. And if for some reason that business was tied to your instant offense, you really need to outline why, why that is not going to be the case moving forward, how you can ensure that there's no criminal activity in that. In that. And that's a, that's a hard struggle to do, but you can do it. I've seen people do it. What I'm continuing to hear, John, through these themes, and it echoes the lengthy conversation you had with Michael, if someone wants to return to their own business, or if someone wants to build a new business, it would make sense that they clearly articulate by way of their both pre-sentence and post-sentence release plan what they've done, why they're worthy of it, the, the experience they might have to actually do it. I attended a sentencing hearing many years ago where a defendant told the judge he wanted to open up a residential reentry center to help people struggling with addiction. And the judge cut him off and said, you haven't dealt with your own addictions. You have no plan to do this. There's no evidence that you have the skill set to do this. You're telling me what I want to hear. Fix yourself first. I think it would have been different had this defendant had a clear record that shows. So just echo one more time for everyone who's thinking, I don't need a reentry plan. Uh, please reinforce it to the point of people are going to say, how many times are these people going to talk about it? Cover that one, I, more, please. Yeah, I can't tell you enough how important I think your reentry plan is going to be to, your, to you moving forward. I tell everybody, everything that prison professors do, the white collar advice, all of these different companies that are advocacy out there, the best advocate for you is you. We can give you guidance. We can give you our best recommendation. I don't advocate for individuals. I provide advice. I provide subject matter expertise on what I do. But if you take that and you go back into, into your reentry plan and you develop it based on the guidance and the direction that, and again, I've seen most of the videos on prison professors. I've seen, read Michael's books and those type of things. And that's why I've offered to assist and provide subject matter expertise. He has really good information in there. If you can start developing your reentry plan and become your best advocate in a humble, respectful way, you're going to go be successful in prison. If you're going to tell people what it is you want them to do and you're going to demand and be entitled, you're not going to do very well during your prison sentence. Thank you. Very, very helpful. We're going to splice that and continue to share it on the prison professors community because it reinforces that you need to do the work. You need to take the initiative. Can't outsource that. John, someone asked about administrative remedies on home confinement. Uh, what happens if, it, can you get into trouble on home? What, what does the process look like if you're in home confinement and you don't call the halfway house on time or something more to, do you fail a drug test? Can you fight that process like you can in prison by way of an administrative remedy? Yeah, there's a common misconception that, hey, I can't do administrative remedies when I'm in the community. I've asked the halfway house. They don't even have a BP-9, BP-10, BP-11. They don't even know what they are. So years ago, 
many, many years ago, the Bureau of Prisons adopted that anybody in a halfway house or on home confinement, if they submit a letter and it's in a just a sheet of paper that says, in lieu of an administrative remedy, I was not able to get the form, I'm submitting this, this documentation on my behalf, please treat it as an administrative remedy. It will be treated as an administrative remedy. That goes directly to the RRM office. That should not go to your halfway house director case manager. You should send that to the address that's posted in every halfway house on the RRM who oversees that halfway house or that jurisdiction. Got it. Someone asked, is Medicare reinstated on home confinement? Ah, the good old Medicare question. So remembering that Medicare is administered locally by each state, we did get with Medicaid years ago, actually about three or four years ago, and they did issue a ruling that if an individual who is incarcerated is on home confinement, that Medicare Medi Medicaid could be reinstated. We are still seeing that that can be a battle in some jurisdictions, but the ruling is that yes, it can be reinstated. Again, it's incumbent on you to get that reinstated. And if you know you're going to home confinement, start that when you're still in prison. Start writing to the local office and saying, hey, I am coming out. I've been told I'm going on home confinement on this day. I'll be more than happy to verify when I get on home confinement, but I'd like to start the process to reinstate my Medicaid or Medicare. Thank you. Someone asked, what if the post-release plan includes retirement? There is no job needed. Is that frowned upon? Is that even allowed? So it is. It's, it's not frowned upon. It's allowed. Uh, I am a, a firm proponent of retirement myself. As I said, I've retired from the prison. So, you know, yes, you know, it's not expected to be whoever that's already worked, already retired from the career, go back to work. It is a, expected that you engage in productive activities. So what we would like to see in your rancher plan is I'm going to volunteer at my church. I'm going to volunteer at the shelter, I'm going to assist doing this. I'm gonna take care of my elderly spouse. Whatever it is you're going to be doing that are very productive activities, and that's why you need to go on home confinement, you really need to clearly outline that because now you're saying that work is no longer a need. One of the priorities of a halfway house is to assist you in gaining employment. So if work's no longer a need and you have housing, then what is it you're going to be doing and what are your needs to, to be released to the community early through those type of programs? Very Thanks, helpful. Justin. Thank you. Someone asked how much influence or involvement does the sentencing judge, judge have on anything? I think post-sentencing. So you're sentenced, someone's going to prison, they're creating the release plan. Will the judge, could the judge have any influence in the future on that person that he just sentenced? So the judges are very influential and and should be, their judges are very powerful individuals appointed for life. So the Bureau of Prisons takes any recommendation from the judiciary very, very seriously. So yes, the judge can still have impact that, you know, we see a lot of times where you've gone through the administrative remedy process and you're now going through a legal process and you're taking your case back to that same judge. So yes, I would tell you the judge, is, is always somebody you want to keep on your side. <laughs> for, for those of you watching, there are a number of judges who have told us sometimes they fears if defendants tell them what they want to hear. So imagine if years later, you're trying to get off supervised release early. There's value in showing the record that you've created by way of this release plan. So you can kind of show the judge, I told you I was going to do this. I've done it. It's much different than some people that say they're going to do it and they don't. So certainly you may see that judge again in the future. John, I'm going to mute everyone and then ask you to unmute yourself in just a second, okay? Because one second. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. John, I, I want to transition into some questions that we're getting, and I have more questions from people in our community. Uh, Matt, who's uh, a recent in our community, mentioned that some people actually learned, lost some of their earned time credits. In fact, uh, Tammy at 1004 wrote, I just learned that my First Step Act credits were taken off my end release date and my BOP changed yesterday. Do you know why this is? Nope, I don't know why. I can tell you that there's, there's a number of reasons why it may be. 
It could be that your needs assessment's not completed. So they took some of those projected time back up. It could be that in looking at your sentence computation, you had more time available or less time available. It could be there's a disciplinary infraction. It could be that they have you down as refusing a program. It could be that they had that you failed a program. So that's a discussion that you need to have very, very quickly with your case manager. And you need to show them that, you know, here's a sentence computation that showed that I had X number of earned time credits. And here's the new sentence computation. Can you just please give me an explanation of why there's a difference? And you're not saying, hey, I, I, I absolutely should have 60 earned time credits instead of 30. It's can you show me why there's a difference and how that difference is calculated? Have a discussion, have a respectful discussion with your case manager. Thank you. I'm going to continue to go through questions. Someone asked, I'm self-surrendering Tuesday for 60 months. What's the earliest one can ask for home confinement under the CARES Act? Under the CARES Act, the, the earliest would be the entire 60 months. But again, that, that's determined on what's going on with your individual circumstances and everything else. Reasonably, you know, a year or two, there's, there's a lot of other factors that go into home confinement. And again, I caution everybody, everything is based on individual circumstances. If you're an elderly individual, you may qualify under the elderly offender program. If you have medical conditions and, and at high risk for COVID, you may qualify under the CARES Act. If you're going to qualify only under the 1836-21, the earliest would be the 10 month 6% date. So all of those different factors, we, we would have to make those calculations. Someone asked if an inmate has a well-defined and detailed release plan, how does one handle it if the case manager says there isn't a place to add all of this information? Does the system use, use the, have a place for case notes or to reference additional pages? If, um, how would you encourage someone to respond to that? Yeah, you always have the ability to add additional pages, you know, see attached. And, you know, I would encourage you, you again, respectfully in a good discussion, hey, I would like to bring you my initial reentry re plan, my initial release plan, the first time we meet. And then the next couple of times we meet, I'd just like to provide you updates. So we're not going through and rehashing the entire reentry plan. I just want to show you that I am working towards my goals. I am doing positive activities. And here's what I want to highlight as we move forward. You don't have to get your whole entire reentry plan posted again. And again, keep copies yourself. When it comes time to send that to your probation officer, when it comes time to show that at the, at the halfway house, you're going to have that entire release plan, that entire reentry plan, and you're going to take it and show it, and you're going to highlight all those positive things that you've done while you're incarcerated. Excellent. Now I'm going to transition to a little longer question here, but this will be applicable. John, I'm going to read this. I sent this to you a little earlier. My question is regarding eligibility for halfway house home confinement. I've read the material and I'm still confused. I'm trying to project, I'm trying to do a projected calculation for 72 months with RDAP and 13 months in detention. Is eligibility, assuming minimum security, no infractions, is eligibility not to exceed 12 months as I'm reading under the First Step Act? or is it the last 18 months of the sentence? So that gets into what we discussed earlier. Eligibility is defined separately under each law. So Second Chance Act defines eligibility up to 12 months for placement in a halfway house or up to six months, 10% exactly. day for placement on home confinement based on a five factor review. The First Step Act allows for additional placement based on earned time credits. And that additional placement can be any number of earned time credits that you have over that 12 months earned time credit. So again, it could be two years, it could be three years if you have those earned time credits. Now there is a caveat in the First Step Act, again, that allows for individuals who are elderly mm -hmm. to be placed on home confinement for the entirety of their sentence. So there are no time restrictions under that. As long as the CARES Act is going on, and you're, you're determined to be eligible under the CARES Act, there is no time limit. So it depends on what's, what statute or what, what legal authority you're being referred under. Generally, the law allows for up to 12 months in a halfway house, 
plus additional time for earned time credits if you earn them. And it allows for six months, 10% of your sentence on home confinement or additional time based on earned time credits if you earn them. And then there's a special provision for those that are elderly over 60 that are placed under the elderly offender. Act. Got it. Very helpful. That, thank you. Someone asked about CARES Act qualifications. Does it only apply to the inmate? He is generally okay. The spouse, however, what if the spouse is sick and 100% caregiver? Is, uh, is my illness CARES Act related or does it actually have to do with the, the inmate being medically vulnerable? So CARES Act placements are, are due to your individual risk. There are criteria under compassionate release if you're the primary caregiver for somebody else, that you can apply for a release under the Compassionate Release Authorities, that is not a CARES Act placement. Got Good it. Question. Thank, thank you. Someone asked, can a defendant who is in prison or the halfway house be allowed to visit aging parents close to dying through an escorted visit with BOP security? I know the answer would be different with prison versus the halfway house, but that does come up a lot. So, and we do that quite frequently. So... Generally, you know, furloughs and passes from halfway houses are generally easier than from prison. So if there's an elderly, if there's somebody that, that's invalid that you need to go visit, deathbed visits or hospital visits are usually the two that, that are allowable. Those are usually fairly easy to do out of a halfway house or home confinement. Thank you. Someone asked about permissions in halfway house versus home confinement. Can you explain as briefly as you can what you're permitted to do in home confinement and halfway house? In the halfway house, can you go to the grocery store? What can you expect? I know some people go to the halfway house, they wish they were back in prison because they're in their smaller community. They think they're gonna be out, allowed to leave. Some forget they're still confined, they're still locked up. So what advice would you have to regarding you know passes and expectations? Yeah, so generally both halfway houses and home confinement you're allowed to leave your house or allowed to leave the, the DRC, the halfway house, for productive activities. So if you're going out employment searching, you're going out to work, you're going to church, you're going to those type of things. Those are generally allowed in both halfway house and on home confinement. Now, sometimes, depending on your level of risk and depending on the crime you committed and the level of need you have, those passes and things are phased in. So they, you get at the halfway house and the first week you're there, they don't let you go anywhere. And the second week, they allow you to go to Walmart. The third week, they allow you to start job searching. So it all depends on, again, your individual circumstances. But generally, if you have that good release plan and you start saying, that, hey, I've lined up, I've got these job interviews, I'm going out and looking at these employment, I'm going out to do this. And they're productive activities. They're things that are going to assist you in your reentry. Generally, those are going to be allowed. So I will tell you, when I was in the halfway house, after two or three days, John, I saw people lying. They said they were going to go to the DMV to get their driver's license, and they'd leave the halfway house. And a block away, apparently, they'd get picked up. And they didn't report back on time, or it was found out. And what are the consequences if, if something happens in, in the halfway house? What, what can some of the repercussions include? Yeah, generally, again, I, I encourage everybody to be very honest and truthful about what you're doing. Because generally, if you're honest and truthful, we can work it out. You know, if you need to go see something, if you need to go do something, we can work that out. The minute you show that you're dishonest or untruthful, or you get caught doing things, we we have a couple different things. If we determine that you're a risk to the halfway house or you're a risk to the community, the marshals are gonna come and they're gonna lock you back up. If we determine that, okay, this is a very low risk, the infraction was very minor, then we impose the disciplinary sanctions in accordance with the incident report, the same as in the institution. So two different options there. And a lot of people get, get wrapped around well, what I did was pretty minor. I shouldn't have gotten in trouble. The marshals came and they put me back in jail and I sat in jail the rest of my sentence. Well, again, that's a very discretionary call on the part of the RRM about the level of risk contained with your disciplinary infraction. So if you went out there and you were a, a very high risk inmate to begin with, and you got in a car instead of riding the bus to where you're supposed to go, 
the RM may determine that's very high risk behavior because you're not showing that you're going to be productive or compliant with the rules of the halfway house. And they can just immediately return you back to prison. And what's inconvenient, and everyone should know, and I saw at least 10 instances in the three months, I was on the halfway house for just six weeks. I saw 10 instances where people were rearrested. And I'm gonna mute everyone again and then please unmute yourself. I saw 10 instances where people were rearrested. The marshals show up and to be clear, they didn't go back to Taft camp. They didn't go back to the minimum security camp at Lompoc. They finished the rest of their sentence at the Metropolitan Detention Center, which in many cases was an experience. None of them had ever endured detention to that degree. They'd always been in the camp. So it's not like, oh, we're gonna drive you back to the camp now. No, you're going to the detention center to finish your sentence. You are still in custody while you were in the halfway house. Do not get lazy. I know that you feel free. You're in your own clothes. You have passes. You can go to your own restaurant. You can see your family. You're still confined and you cannot let your guard down. John, someone yeah, asked you, about, go you ahead. Can't stress that. You can't stress that enough, Justin. Yeah. You're getting these freedoms because you've shown that you're now applicable for the community. The minute you show that you're not, and it may not even be a Bureau of Prisons facility. You might be put in a local jail and yeah. horrible, horrible, horrific conditions in some of these local jails. But that's where you'll sit for the remainder of your sentence. Truthful and honesty go so long. And also in our in our webinar on disciplinary infractions and administrative remedy, if you did it, you can fight it, you can respond. However, we encourage if you did it, you're going to probably get a better outcome if you say, I made a mistake, I learned from this, it will never happen again. There have been instances of people in prison who showed up late for work two or three times. In one instance, someone took a pair of pants and they had it sewn into a pair of inappropriate shorts and the guard said, you can't wear those. That's a disciplinary infraction. And rather than fight it, everyone else wears it. It's not that big a deal. I can't afford to buy clothes in the commissary. The, the inmate said, you're right, it's a mistake. I'll throw them away. And the guard or the correctional officer didn't write him up. So like so many people who become immersed in a government investigation, oftentimes it's the response, the preparation. It's really no different in prison or the halfway house if something happens. Be honest, own it. And something they will often ask you, if they'll look at in a, K, a team meeting in prison, do you have any infractions? If you do, own it. And John suggested last week, if you did make a mistake in prison, you should write about it in your reentry plan because the probation officer is going to have your file and know and there could be a risk if you withhold it or don't disclose it and they find out about it, they may think, what else is this person hiding from us? Be transparent, document it, have it come from you. If not, they're gonna form their own opinion and it might not be the outcome that you like. Be honest, be open, document it and write it out. John, we're gonna to continue to go through some rapid fire questions here. Someone on pretrial house arrest wrote, while I'm on pretrial house arrest, I was told I will not receive any time service for this house arrest. Why do I get credit for home confinement, which appears to be less stringent than the house arrest I am currently on? Was I given bad information by my probation officer and my lawyer? This doesn't sound logical. I have been on this strict house arrest for about a year. Pre-trial house release, you're not in the custody of the Bureau of Prisons. Mm -hmm. You're in the custody of the court. You're, if you're in the custody of the US Marshals or the Bureau of Prisons, you get jail credit for that time. You do not get custody credits for time that you're being allowed to remain at your house under the court's supervision. Got it. For, for those of you watching, we attended a conference with Judge Bulware, a federal judge from Nevada, who said that he is not necessarily swayed by people who may go to a minimum security camp. In fact, John, it was funny. He said to all the lawyers in the room, your clients are not going to the penitentiary. I've been to these minimum security camps. This is not Shawshank Redemption or Cool Hand Luke. The point that he was making is, you can articulate collateral consequences besides just the prison term. So for example, if you've been on house arrest, if you've lost your job, if you've suffered significantly because of your conviction, those are good mitigating factors to build into your pre-sentencing plan. Because Judge Carter, for example, I mentioned earlier, has told people in our community at sentencing, I know you've been in the dungeon for three years waiting. I know that it's tough to live in the land of the lost and the unknown. And I want you to know you've been productive during this time. I'm going to factor that into my sentence today because I know many of you, while you wait to get sentenced, you feel like you're already in prison, but you're not getting credit. But if you can build into the release plan or pre-sentencing plan, how you're productive, how you're using this experience wisely, and most importantly, why you will never return to another courtroom, you advance your agenda and our team thinks you advance your ability to, to truly advocate for yourself. Okay, I'm going to mute everyone again, John. I'm going to ask a question, then ask you to unmute yourself. 
Someone asked a, an important question, John, about the, the release plan. They had mentioned, my crime was committed seven to 10 years ago, but recently charged, and I've been working without incident since. Do you think I should include this information in my release plan? Absolutely. Include everything that you've done since the time that you, you aired, you made a mistake, you committed a crime, how you've recognized that, and how you've improved yourself since, regardless of when you were sentenced. Got it. Perfect. Again, it's always coming back down to advocacy, you doing the work. We have resources, we can guide you, we have templates, we have courses. Take the initiative to write it and create it. If not, you might be judged by your plea agreement, these press releases, and a version of events that I know you do not agree with. You've got to take the initiative and advocate. John, someone asked on a year and a day sentence, are they eligible for both the First Step Act and also the Second Chance Act on a year and a day sentence? Yes. Okay, good. And that comes into play because some people feel, even on a 12-month sentence, John, I know some people get sentenced to 12 months and they don't qualify for that ERD time. Are they also still eligible? Any, any sentence length that you do, you're still eligible for earned time credits as long as you get your needs assessment done and your program credits. Okay, got it. I see some hands coming up. Um, John, someone asked what age is considered elderly within the, the Bureau of Prisons? Unfortunately, 60 and above. I don't personally believe that's elderly, but 60 and above. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rosa asked, what if a person's case manager is not helpful or assisting someone in the camp? How does he find someone in the facility or within the Bureau of Prisons who will help him or give him information to request his record, reflecting his concerns in his reentry plan? Yeah, so again, everybody varying degrees of professionalism, be your best advocate. Very humbly, very respectfully, there's a chain of command for everybody. If the case manager is not helpful, go to the unit manager. If the unit manager is not helpful, then start going to associate wardens or case management coordinators, but do so humbly and respectfully, especially when you're going to say, hey, I asked Justin for this and he refused to give it to me. That's not the approach. You know, I've asked for this. I understand people are very busy. Is there any way you can assist me in obtaining this? Someone asked about medical records and, and they're getting ready to go to prison and they have health issues. It's a 24 month sentence and naturally they wanna to try to pursue an earlier release in part due to COVID. They asked, uh, and this has come up several times, I have medical records from specialists. Should I have medical records from specialists sent in and present to them to medical at the staff? In other words, should the, should the inmate surrender with the medical records? Should the family send medical records to the case manager? Should the doctor send them directly? Perhaps someone could think, well, you've created these records. You know, they may not be real. How should someone get this in to a potential so, case manager or warden? So there's a number of different ways you can submit medical records to the Bureau of Prisons. So the first way is prior to your sentencing, give copies to the court. If you haven't been sentenced yet, if you're not in custody, ensure that the court has copies of it, because then the court's going to provide those in an official manner to the Bureau of Prisons. If you've been sentenced and you've yet to surrender, you can submit medical documentation to the Designation Sentence Computation Center down in Grand Prairie, Texas. And you can do that via email. Their email is on the website. And the third way is to, yes, take those medical records, copies of those medical records. Please don't take your originals. Take copies of those with you when you surrender and give those to the, the officers when you surrender. So this is the power of advocacy and learning. So we have all of these resources on prison professors. And I know there are so many words and so many articles. Michael produces content every day. He's now creating content for prisons, continuing to create content for prisons and jails across the country. So I know there's so much content. If you have a question and you can't find it because you feel like you're just swimming through the ocean, there's just so much, send us an email. Our team will respond and we'll direct you to the right point on the website. Or if you're in our community, of course, we're going to walk you through that process. We don't want you to feel overwhelmed, but something that John said is relevant. There are people who have given tens of thousands of dollars to a lawyer to send a letter to the warden and the board never responds, and the lawyer thinks by sending a letter to the warden, it's a health issue, they're gonna get out of prison early. They're not following the process, and they wonder why they never get a response. We cannot guarantee that you'll be successful, but if you wanna follow the process, 
John is telling you the process that you need to follow to get medical records there, how to build the release plan. The onus is on you to do it. Our team can help, but we want you to follow the process and we want you to be honest and authentic. If you've made a mistake, build it into the release plan. Release plan, accept responsibility. Please, you are dealing with people who were in prison. We've made bad decisions. If you pled guilty, it's incumbent on all of us to create this record so we can influence these stakeholders from your probation officer to the judge to the case manager, absolutely everyone. We're begging you to do the work because we know what you want. We know you want to get out of prison earlier. We know you want higher levels of liberty and home confinement and probation. That's only going to happen by work and documentation and showing why you're building a new record. I cannot stress it enough. Someone asked John, um, that there's so many questions here. What one, one moment. There's so many here I wanted to ask. My outdate has not changed on a year and a day sentence since day one. I'm now in home confinement. Any ideas why? I've not had any, had any infractions and had 20 days noted in October, but they were not taken off my original release date. What advice would you give to someone who's waiting on some of these computations to come through? So again, if you're already in the halfway house or already on home confinement, go through your case manager at the halfway house and ask that they contact the Bureau of Prisons, the Residential Reentry Management Office, to please provide you an explanation of what's going on with your sentence computation. Give them your individual specifics. This is what I'm seeing. I, I worked on a case for, for Justin and Michael a week or so ago, and an individual says, well, here, here's my sentence computation, and it was a, a year-old sentence computation. And I nor anybody else can compare that to a current sentence computation unless you have them in, in your hand. So make sure that you're getting that documentation. You can show that, hey, my sentence computation hasn't changed. Here's the release date. Here's the release date on BOP.gov. Can you please explain this to me? It appears that I should be getting some earned time credits. It appears they're not accurately reflected on my sentence comp. Can you please explain that to me or give me somebody who can? And again, look at the language I'm using. You know, can you please provide it? It appears that it may be, I'm not assigning blame. I'm not telling them that the Bureau of Prisons didn't give me my, my earned time credits that I'm entitled to. I want this sentence comp changed and it needs to be changed now. You know, it appears that my sentence comp is inaccurately reflecting. If it's not inaccurate, can you please explain to me why? Thank you. John, John that, was, that was me that asked that question. Um, I did talk to the case manager. Um, she didn't understand, she didn't know why either. And I actually have a sister with the exact same issue. Um, then then you, need to, you need to elevate it. The case manager at the halfway house needs to call the Bureau of Prison and preferably while you're sitting in her office. Okay, I'll, Richie, I'll be there tomorrow. You. Good, good. I'm glad, Linda, you have a plan of action for tomorrow. Richie, I see your hand up. Tammy, I'll come to you next. Richie, good to see you. What's your question for John? John, um, my biggest thing from my, my wife and my daughter is I have a 90-month sentence, and so we're just kind of thinking about the, the you know, Scott, those things, but what's the, the goal of the halfway house for reunification with family and what, what's allowed? How do you guys promote it? you know, passes or how, how does that work with, you know, with my daughter, my wife, once they get to a halfway so, house? So reunification of family is a big deal. I mean, they're your support structure. They're really going to help you either succeed or not. You know, having this really important, you know, supporting structure is, is incredible. So the more you can articulate that, now I will tell you, it's counterproductive to have your family come visit you at the halfway house. Take the passes that you can. And if it's an hour long pass to get out and see your family, take that hour long pass to go out and see your family. I hear so many people, well, they're only going to give me an hour. I'm not going to go see my family. Well, then it wasn't really fucking important to you. You know, I'm sorry, but truly it could not have been that important to you if you were given an hour and you refused to take it because you got to do these things, you know, it's, it's a progressive thing. I'm going to give you an hour today. I'm going to give you eight hours on Saturday and next weekend, I'm going to give you the whole weekend. So it's very progressive. So if that's what's important to you and it, it's, it's apparent to me that it is, then make sure that you take every minute you can to re-engage with that supportive structure and let people know that this is that important to me because it's, it's, it's important to the Bureau of Prisons. 
Thank you. Someone left a comment. I want to reiterate. Thank you, John, for this. This is for Justin. Just a thought since this is so such an overwhelming process. Is there a way to create a checklist to do before surrendering? Everyone should know uh, I, both Michael and I have each done a webinar on top 10 tips to prepare for surrendering to prison. It's on our resource webinar page. I did it last month. One webinar was tips one through five. The next week's webinar was tips six through 10. Please watch that. Please watch that webinar. We also have a very lengthy article that covers the top 10 tips to surrender into prison. It's not boilerplate nonsense too. It's real tips, the release plan, point of contacts, reading with a purpose, book reports, how to avoid disciplinary infractions. So John, you should know, we'll resend this information out to everyone, but we've covered it with a very clearly defined self-surrender checklist uh, that, that you can absolutely implement. Tammy, you've been patiently waiting. Thank you. If you're still there, Tammy, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question for John. Also, everyone, it's 11 a.m. here in Los Angeles. We'll be wrapping up soon. We're if you have questions, I encourage you to yeah. hit the yellow Zoom button. I will call on you, but I expect we'll have a we'll wrap up here in the next 20 or 30 minutes or sooner, depending on questions. That said, Tammy, what is your question? Okay, real quick, I have two com a comment to talk about medical records, and I'll tell you what I had to do because I am out on CARES Act. I had my specialist records and kept them at home. I was evaluated by the physician, went through my whole history, who did fail to put it in my history. In two months, I was transferred from one uh, camp to another camp that had nothing in my records to show any of this that I was eligible for CARES Act. So I had to have my records sent in I had to request my medical records to see that they had put it on before and it all fell through. So I had my medical records readily available that I could get them into the physician and get it taken care of because if not, and I started about two months before I was at my 25% of my students served on that. I commend you for having question, a really good self-advocacy in that place. <laughs> I have been a very self-advocate and advocating for other people as well. Now, as far as I'm the one who wrote that, I received an email from some girls that are at a camp, and they advised me that they had been told by their case manager as of the day before yesterday that all their FSA credits were being taken away, and they would not be reapplied until they've done three teams. That being said, that prompted me to look and my date has now changed and gone back to retroactive back to my original date. And they did apply FSA, but now they've taken it off to get my date released earlier on my uh, CARES Act. So at this point, I called the RRM in Grand Prairie because I am in Texas and spoke with a case manager there who advised me don't worry about it. It'll all change around because at my halfway house, I have no assistance at all. My case manager asked me stuff and knows that I have researched a lot and read a lot. So yeah, my question Tammy, to you I, is, am I going to get this FSA back? <laughs> and, yes. and I've asked, my deal is, how can I earn more FSA? And that's been a question I asked last time. The case manager at RM advised me today, they don't really know. They do say if you're working, they're going to end up figuring something out and applying it. Well, I have been working since 10 days after I got home. Right. So, so, so a couple, of, question couple things you brought okay, up there, which I think are, is really relevant. Again, I, I know they're diligently working on updating all the sentence computations. Because of the individual circumstances of different sentence computations, there have been some individuals that, that have had time taken off. There have been some people time added. I think you're going to see that corrected over the next couple of days or the, or the next week or so. And that that's what I'm hearing is that, you know, they are working, they are looking at those individual circumstances. As to earning additional time credits while you're in the community, the presumption is that you're going to earn the maximum time credits just for being in the community. So if you're in the community for 60 days, you're going to earn the maximum time credits for those two months. That's the presumption in the rule that the Bureau of Prisons published. That, thank you. John, I wanna ask, some, someone asked about the eligibility even for COVID. If it's 25% of your sentence, is that on the total sentence 
or is the 25% after they give you credit, after you earn, after you get your good time credit? In your total sentence. Yeah, it's the total your good time sentence. credit. Correct, total sentence imposed. Uh, thank no, you, John. There, there, time credit. Th thank you, thank you. John, there, there's this obsession that people have when they read about the COVID and CARES Act. And I want you to offer advice to people about the importance of embracing the reality that while you might want to get out of prison early due to COVID, there are some people who might buy into false hope or think that once they hit this 25% number, they're immediately going to be released. We want to advocate. We want to be honest and honorable and remind people that while you try, there's not a likelihood or it may happen, but be careful about what you're hearing and believing and reading because if people don't get the news they want, they can get depressed and it can really impact their adjustments. So speak to managing expectations as people go through this process. Yeah, there again, there's no entitlements under the CARES Act. You're not entitled to be placed out early on that 25% date. You're not in, entitled to placement in the community under the CARES Act. All of the CARES Act is incredibly discretionary on the part of the staff in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Number one, to determine your eligibility. Number one, to determine the, the COVID rates in the community that you're releasing to versus the COVID rates in the prison that you're sitting in. All of those different variables and individual circumstances you know, are, are, are a myriad of different circumstances. So I encourage you that if you think you're eligible under CARES Act, then absolutely bring that up and have that discussion with your case manager and be respectful. And, and if you need to elevate it, then, then elevate it, but continue to advocate for yourself. And, you know, nothing against what, what Tammy said, but be careful about having other inmates advocate for you. It usually falls on deaf ears when you have somebody else advocate for you. What prison professors, what I try to do is make sure and give you the tools to advocate for yourself and take those things up and, and do self-advocacy. Be careful, and I tell everybody, do your own time. Be careful about getting involved in advocacy for others because then your self-advocacy and that advocacy for others is taken as, as less. Yeah, that, that's important for everyone. It really does require doing doing the work there are people who the lion's share of people in our community watch the videos they're writing their release plan if you're working with our team we're editing it getting very involved in that process but there have also been few people even if it's just a small snippet who have attended the webinars and then they surrender to prison and they're asking questions that we have covered extensively or they're buying into the jailhouse gossip or they're upset that they're immediately should be, uh, immediately be eligible to get released from prison under the First Step Act, and they're angry that they're not. And this requires work. If you look at Michael's journey, he went to prison in 1987, and for decades, he's been writing about the opportunity to earn freedom. That's the book that all of you should read and you can get for free. When Michael was in prison, there wasn't a mechanism to advance his release date. That didn't mean he didn't spend years and time advocating for this policy that became implemented in late 2018. You all have opportunities to earn your way home earlier if, if you can do it. And John, that's how I kind of want to wrap up this webinar. You, you've been with the Bureau of Prisons for a long time. When Michael was in prison, there, there wasn't this mechanism to demonstrate, even if you're extraordinary and compelling, that you could come home earlier. And that's changed with the First Step Act. There are mechanisms that, that exist. Can you talk about for this prison reform and why it's in everyone's interest to do what I think Michael was doing, even when there was no benefit and it would advance his release date. I want everyone to prepare. Please touch on that. Yeah, I think, Justin, you hit on, on something really important. Number one, Justin, uh, Michael started his preparation regardless of any incentive. He was doing the right thing because it was the right thing to do. And, you know, I tell when you're managing your own expectations, yes, if you think you're eligible for CARES Act, put in. If, you're, if you want to take programs and you think they should apply towards earned time credit, advocate for yourself. Advocate for yourself strongly. But advocate for yourself because it's the right thing to do. Don't advocate for yourself because you feel that you're entitled to more earned time credits or you're entitled to be in the community or you deserve to be in the community. Because people don't want to hear those words. They want to hear that, hey, 
I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do. And because I'm doing the right thing, I would appreciate some assistance with moving this forward. The time frame right now and what we're seeing, and even, even with the First Step Act and earn time credits, everybody says, oh, it's taking forever for the Bureau to implement this. Well, you're taking this huge organization that's so entrenched in the way that they've done things and you're changing the entire philosophy of an agency. And Ms. Peters is doing an amazing job in changing the philosophy and culture of that agency. But it's like changing the Titanic with an oar. You know, you're trying to paddle on one side of the boat to get it to change direction. And it's going to take some time. You have to be patient. I know it's frustrating. I know it, it's impacting some people very personally, but you have to be professional. You have to be very cognizant and respectful when you're going and talking to people and do so in a way that you're advocating for yourself and moving yourself so you're going to have a successful journey. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. The last thing I'll say before we, we, we wrap it up, Michael interviewed uh, Chris Maloney, who is the federal head of federal probation, a colleague of John's. And Michael asked John, what, liberty, what level of supervision would most likely have applied to someone who served 26 years in prison? And Mr. Maloney said, well, we probably would have had a ton of supervision on you. You did 26 years. That's a long time. You probably don't have jobs or a support network, so we might place more supervision on you. Instead, because of the release plan that Michael built, Michael was able to work as a professor. He was actually able to move districts from Northern California to Southern California. His probation officer allowed us to work. I'd been home for four years. The probation officer supported Michael and I working together, all based on the work that he did while in custody. So there's a comment here. Someone said, should I bring my release plan or my pre-sentencing plan to the probation officer? Well, let me ask you, John, does the case manager in custody have access to the pre-sentence report? Do they have access to that information besides a federal judge? Yes. So if you're looking to influence the stakeholders, it would probably make sense if you are building an authentic release plan, even before sentencing, certainly along with your narrative, you should share that with the probation officer. Because John, Chris Maloney also told Michael, one of the first things a federal probation officer does, they go back years earlier and they read the probation report, right? Isn't that correct? Right. Absolutely. Yeah, so and think it, about this. Go ahead, John, go ahead. Well, so that pre-sentence report is what you use to determine your security classification score. And mitigating factors in that pre-sentence report are incredible. Yeah, so that comes down to the power of advocacy and doing work that may not pay off for years to come. But if you know at some point you're going to be released from prison and meet with a federal probation officer and they are trained to read your probation report, does it advance your agenda if you've got a realistic plan in there and then you continue to build on it post-sentencing? And it may not pay off for years to come, but it's coming. And I think Michael and others in our community are a testament to the fact that the work has to be created and done. And... Um, that's the way that I th we believe you can pos positively influence people. With that said, I want to see if there's any other questions. I'm sure there are some that we missed. Our team will certainly re respond to them in future videos and blogs. I think everyone's been appreciative that, that you were here. Let me see. Yes, the case manager will have access to the pre-sentence report in prison. John, they don't have access to the sentencing memorandum, correct? So the, the defense attorney produces a sentencing memorandum that articulates why their client should get leniency. What, what, yeah, else no, does do case manager, what else does the case manager have access to? So they have access generally to your, your judgment commitment order, your pre-sentence report, and the statement of reasons. Okay. And then any documentation that the probation officer believes is relevant. John, last thought. Someone in this webinar sat for their, I got this via text message. They sat for their probation report. They didn't feel as if they were prepared for it because sometimes people think it's a five minute interview and they don't respond appropriately. And there are some there are some things that are in the pro there are some things they wish were in the probation report that are not in the probation report, and the report has been completed, but they haven't been sentenced. Is there a chance at sentencing more rec more details can get into the probation report? And also, if someone's already been sentenced to prison, is it possible to amend this probation report to further reflect some some facts they feel were withheld? So you can always amend the sentence the the pre sentence report. 
and you can always present additional information. The best time to do that, of course, is before sentencing. Get it to your probation officer. Talk about the fact that, hey, I have some information. I didn't have it available when I met with you the first time. Can we please make sure this gets to the court? And generally, they'll, they'll do an addendum and they'll include that additional information. Um, same post-sentencing, if you haven't surrendered yet, you can still get that addendum in there. It generally will not affect your sentencing at that point in time. And then once you are in the Bureau of Prisons, that's when it needs to get into your case management report and into your release plan. Thank you, John. Last question, then we're going to wrap it up. Someone asked, Frank asked, good to see you, Frank. How can someone take advantage of the First Step Act, Elderly Offender Act, and Second Chance Act? Can, can they benefit from that all at once? Yep. <laughs> so any, anybody that goes out under the First Step Act, Second Chance Act, and is all is benefiting from all of it. So First Step Act gives you the earned time credits. The Second Chance Act gives you the five-factor review. And then the elderly offender program is, is taken into consideration if you're 60 years or older and have served two thirds of your sentence. So yes, it's, it's really cumulative. It's really all put together to make that best determination of what's going on. Excellent, thank you. So the last comment I'll say, someone asked if we could receive a copy of the release plan you showed or a template. Yes, today's the 12th. Tomorrow we will mail out the recorded replay of this webinar and I will include the release plan template that Michael created and worked alongside John to help create based on what we've learned from experts. So John, thank you so much for giving your time today, last week, all the time you've given to the Prison Professors nonprofit community to help create this best in class reentry plan that everyone in this community should begin to create, whether you've been sentenced or not. If you've already been sentenced, create it and build it. It's a dynamic document that will grow. So John, we're grateful for your attention and time and expertise. Thank you for continuing to contribute and to all of you for joining this webinar today. Thank you again, John. Thank you, Justin. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.